Give it just another second, Barry, and then I'll introduce you. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. First, um, I, you know, I, I got, I had this amazing experience. So did Barry, by the way, uh, that that I got invited to an event in uh, Palm Springs, which was a very unusual event, and it had, uh, it had, it covered uh, basically a very wide range of things: machine learning, uh, automation, uh, robotics. And the most interesting was space. And so we, there were speakers all day, every day, or all morning, every morning, uh, talking about different uh, kind of the very latest events happening in, in each of those fields. And Barry Barish did not speak at that conference, but he was there like I was. The reason why I'm making that point is because I had a chance to meet a lot of people in the conference. The most interesting person I met in the whole conference was Barry Barish. And, uh, and he and I had a chance to have several conversations, and, and you'll understand why I say that in a minute. But um, a little bit about him, he, he, he grew up in, in, North, in Southern California. He uh, went to Caltech, or went to Berkeley, uh, went down to get his degree there. And, and, and he's been yeah, basically a scientist, a physicist his entire career. And he's really, as I, as I said to him, and I said to some of you the other day, he's really at, at the uppermost part of his career right now at his current age, and he's still going up, and you'll understand why in a minute. He's made, uh, he led a group of people, a, a team that's really created since, I guess it started in 94, LIGO. Uh, but it's, this is a very long-term project, and the ultimate outcome of this has been that they finally, as you'll, as you'll see, uh, reached farther into space than, than anybody's ever reached before by a factor of, I'm not sure how many, you'll tell us. Uh, Barry, I, I am really honored to have you here. You know, you're, it's really a pleasure to have somebody of your stature here. Uh, we usually just have regular people like me. <laughs> but thank you. Turn this on. There you go. What is this? Well, I used to see Logitech in front of my face all the time because the first little video camera that I had on my PC before they were built in was Logitech, so. <laughs> anyway, at this interesting meeting, Bracken and I would talk in the halls and he probed me. And uh, I'm known now for this graph picture here, which some of you have probably seen. It was on the front page of the New York Times and you know everywhere else almost that you popular science things. It's the discovery of gravitational waves. If we finish this lecture properly, you're going to be able to understand what this is and what it took to do it better. That's what I'm going to try. So that's my goal. Uh, it now appears, for example, I, I walked down, I was warned where to go, but I walked down Madison Avenue in New York and went by a fancy women's shop and there they were dresses and women's clothes made with this uh, symbol on it. So. <laughs> They may not know what it means, but this is, this is the evidence that uh, gravitational waves exist in nature. Uh, <clears throat> they were predicted now 101 years ago by Einstein. And uh, what's shown here, I'll say very quickly, and by the end of the lecture, you should be able to understand it. This is time going this way, and this is sensitivity of measuring something, which I'll describe to you. Uh, usually you should see nothing happening except kind of wiggles, which is how well and sensitive we are. And, uh, and then we see this characteristic shape. This is seen on top in Hanford, Washington, and it's seen here in Livingston, Louisiana, and you see just by eye that they look pretty much alike. Uh, they happen within the speed of light, six mil seven milliseconds of each other. And this is one put on top of the other, slid by seven milliseconds. And uh, uh, you can see that they have pretty much the same shape. That's the raw data. So now what I'll do is try to tell you what it is and then go backwards to tell you um, what it all means. We believe that this story started 1.3 billion years ago when two objects, these are the two objects called black holes, were circling each other like the moon around the earth. And as they circle each other, they uh, have accelerations. And by Einstein's theory, they emit these things called gravitational waves. Eventually, they merge into one object. And so I'll show you that. But I first, let me, 
remind you, if you don't know, what is a black hole? So a black hole is a region of space that's created uh, by having matter that's so dense that nothing can get out. The way it's created is by the collapse of a star. If you remember a star like our star, the, the sun burns by a nuclear fusion process, and it burns the light elements first, eventually it burns them all, and it, it's stable because the burning is pushing everything out while gravity is trying to push it in. Eventually, if you burn up the fuel, it collapses. That's what we call a supernova. So a supernova is when it collapses. If our sun collapses, it'll give some dead object, probably called a neutron star. If it's bigger, it has to be bigger than our sun, bigger than three or four, I won't explain why, but bigger than three or four times the mass of our sun. When it collapses, it can make a region where the gravity is so strong that nothing can get out, and that's what we call a black hole. So that probably says that here. Expected to be three times to 100 times the mass of our sun, and uh, uh, they were either created the way I said, or you could have possibly created black holes in the Big Bang itself. And it's one of the debates we have about what we saw. We're not sure whether the ones we saw were created by the collapse of stars. I'll try to explain maybe if I get to it why. Uh, or maybe in the Big Bang, which is an in in interesting question for people like me. So anyway, that's a black hole. This is here. Okay. I want to emphasize what we're talking about by drawing what we're seeing on top of the map here. So here's where we are approximately, as far as I know. Uh, then I have an object a little south of San Jose and one across the bay from San Francisco. That's how far apart these two objects are when we saw the signal. And each one of them is 30 times the mass of our sun. Our sun is 300,000 times the mass of the Earth which means that each one of these is 10 million times the mass of the Earth compressed into a space that you can fit on the map here. So when I'm saying you make enough gravity in a small space, that gives you a realistic picture of what I'm talking about. These two objects are this size. The other important thing is that they're going pretty fast. They're going about half the speed of light. So they're going really, really fast. So keeping that in mind, this is a computer simulation from the data that we have, not an animation, but a simulation of this convergence. As the two objects are going around each other, then they're going into each other and emitting gravitational weight radiation out. And eventually it comes together, makes one object, which it'll do in just a second, and it shakes a little bit afterwards. So the whole thing that we saw in the very first slide, which I'm gonna show you more, is this coming together finally coalescing, and then a little ring down at the end. And that's what we expect to see. This picture here, as I say, is, a, is not just a computer animation, it's actually calculations from general relativity. So, then what happens? The wave gets made by this collapse, and it travels out. So it's now we have this collapse, the waves themselves travel out, in what form? They actually are, are a distortion of space-time itself. There's no matter traveling out. It's just a wave, a little bit like when you throw a pebble into a pond and there's a wave that goes out. There's no matter in that wave. It just gets propagated out. And the same idea, oops, I hit this wrong. Here we go. So there's no matter in a pond when you, when you do that. It just goes out, and it's the same thing here, that the wave goes out, eventually it comes through space and gets to the Earth. The one that we saw took 1.3 billion years, so we just happen to be here 1.3 billion years later. When it comes to the Earth, it goes right through the Earth, but it distorts space-time, I'm going to describe that for you in a minute, in a way that starts distorting the Earth a little bit. Of course, this is exaggerated. Uh, so. <laughs> So it distorts it a little bit. We can't measure the distortion of the Earth, so instead we make a very fancy instrument, which is called LIGO, which is an interferometer, if people know what interferometers are, but I'm going to describe it to you. And we make two of them uh, to see that what we're seeing, and that's what I'm going to describe. So basically, the story then is that 
three billion years ago, this thing happened. Uh, la September 14th, 2015, um, 15 months ago or so, uh, we saw that it came up through the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, we can tell where it came from by the by the times of arrival in these two instruments, one in Hanford, Washington, one in Livingston, Louisiana, and the signal itself, the differences in the signal itself. And we know that it came from the Southern Hemisphere, not with great accuracy, because we only have two instruments. You need three, as you learn in elementary school, to triangulate. We'll have three later, but that's what we have now. 20 milliseconds later, it came up through the Earth and went through Livingston, Louisiana, the same picture I showed you. Then it goes seven milliseconds later through Hanford, Washington, and then it's gone. And now I drew a little line through it, which you can barely see. And that line comes from what I call general relativity. And you'll see that you can't see it because it looks so much like the data. OK, so now the lecture. So that's the background. Now we're going to try to understand it. So let's start from something we all learned in school. And that's Newton's theory of gravity. So Newton's theory of gravity. We start with uh, two masses, and Newton wrote this down in something called the Principia, or Principia, or Principia, depending on whether you're Latin or in the, that age or now, uh, which was his famous book in the late 1600s, uh, where he basically wrote down what he called the unified theory of gravity. And the unified theory of gravity basically was that he realized that the same phenomena apply to the apple falling from a tree and the moon going around the Earth. So he wrote down one equation, which is this equation, that it goes inversely as the square of the distance away. It's the product of the masses of the two. He actually, in this volume in the 1600s, did the calculus that showed that you could just take the center point of each of these. So he integrated over them and just took the center point, and it's proportional to the masses and a big G. Two things he didn't explain. One is big G, how strong is it? And the other is we grow up and we're told the apple falls and the earth pulls on it or we jump up and the earth pulls down. But why? There was never any description in Newton's theory of what pulls on you. So that's Newton's theory. It was incredibly successful. Uh, it, could, it could describe uh, everything from the tides to you know, normal things like apples falling out of trees. That capital G was understood 100 years later in a very clever experiment by this gentleman, Henry Cavendish, by making a torsion balance. That is a, a, a wire that has wires this way. And if you twist it, it tries to come back to itself. He calibrated it by bringing up some lead weights so he knew how strong the pull was. And, uh, and, and then he was able, in that way, to see what the gravitational pull was, and he got an answer for that capital G uh, in, in uh, 1675 or 1750 or something like that, uh, of 6.75, 10 to the 11th in some units that we use. And the best number now is essentially the same, with a little more decimal points. So this was an incredible, clever experiment done at that point. That's all that had to be done, and then we described almost everything until Einstein came. The next piece of the story is this guy. You probably never heard of, Urban Le Verrier. And he's the father of what's called celestial mechanics. Why? Because he did something that made him famous. He's a, he was a mathematician. He was Frenchman. He lived in France. He basically is famous for the fact that he predicted the existence and the position of Neptune. Neptune wasn't known in his day, but he looked at the discrepancies in the orbits of Uranus, and they didn't follow the right laws that we had in Newton's equations. And so he said there was a, must have been a missing uh, 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 planet. And he then calculated and predicted where it is, where you could look on the sky. And he was dramatic enough to do it by writing a letter to a famous astronomer in Berlin taking into account that it would take five days for the letter to get from Paris to Berlin, told him where to look up in the sky, and he looked up in the sky, and within a degree, he saw the planet. So that's where Neptune was found. And he became very famous for that. 
so where's, what's that story got to do with today? He then went on, uh, this is just telling that story. He, he then went on to uh, look at the planet Mercury. And Mercury is our planet closest to the sun. And it has this uh, very elliptical orbit. And each time it goes around here, around the sun, it uh, comes near all the planets and it basically makes it come back to a different place. So I can calculate how much it moves each time around. And if I do that using Newton's theory, I get about a 10% difference between the real thing and Newton's theory. This was the only place by the time Einstein came along where there was any discrepancy at all in Newton's theory. Of course, Leverrier immediately assumed there must be another planet involved. So he predicted again that there'd be a new planet between Mercury and the sun called Vulcan and that that planet was causing this distortion. Uh, and uh, many experiments were done then between 1859 and Einstein's time, which was early 1900s, uh, saying they saw it, but they ended up being wrong. Uh, so a Vulcan was not found by the time Einstein came along. So that discrepancy existed, but in most of our minds, or at least in my mind, this is hardly the reason to spend 10 years to develop a new theory of gravity. Newton's theory was pretty, pretty successful with this one little teeny flaw. But uh, Einstein did, he's, in 1905, he did three fundamental things that made him famous for physicists. And then uh, uh, in three of the big problems that we had at the, that time. And then he spent 10 years developing the theory of general relativity. So something drove him more than this, I think. Uh, and it was, <laughs> more uh, intuitive and the fact that he had not included accelerations in the theory of special relativity. It, putting accelerations in is equivalent to putting gravity in. So, uh, so Einstein, so this thing then has even been looked at by NASA and never found the Vulcan, but of course it was reinvented for, <laughs> for this. Okay. We're not gonna talk about this formula like I talked about the other formula, but this is the basic formula of Einstein and general relativity. He, he made this in 1915, and it basically has the feature that space and time are unified into one four-dimensional uh, uh, theory, and uh, it's one word in his mind. Uh, Bill Gates doesn't understand that. When I put it in Microsoft Word, I get a wavy line underneath, but true, <laughs> believe me, space-time is one word. So anyway, uh, it's unified in space-time. This is a very difficult thing to calculate. You now have a coordinate system that has all of space and time, and uh, despite the fact that that formula looks difficult, most theoretical physicists couldn't really calculate this very easily, and it's very easy to get wrong answers, to get infinities and so forth. So uh, general relativity wasn't immediately accepted as a new theory of gravity to replace uh, 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 Newton's theory. Uh, it took a forward prediction, something new that you wouldn't have seen in Newton's theory. And uh, Einstein made that prediction. So in 1915, he also made a prediction about the bending of light. And he not only made a prediction about bending of light, but he said how you can measure it. And that is to look at an eclipse of the sun, watch while a star goes behind it, and the apparent position will change. And that's because of the bending of the light. Uh, and uh, what's happening is shown here, which is that an object in general relativity affects the space around it or distorts the space around it a little bit like a trampoline. If you put a big bowling ball in the middle, then you have a marble on the outside, it gets attracted in. So what gets attraction, the attraction in Einstein's theory is through a distortion of space itself or space and time. And, or if you have the earth going around or you take a marble on a trampoline and put it around with a bowling ball in the middle, it'll make an orbit like that. So basically it's the distortion. So if I have, it doesn't matter then once I have a distortion, whether I have a massive object or a massless object like light, if it comes past the earth, it'll get a uh, bent. So that's the prediction of the bending. He predicted how much the bending would be. And uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, who was Arthur Eddington then, but was made Sir afterwards, 
uh, saw this in 1919, and uh, this, the bending of light, captures the public imagination. Einstein's name was all over the press and the world, and that's when he became worldwide famous. He was famous for scientists, like myself, in 1905, after he did his original work. But this is the, uh, the time. OK. So general relativity uh, is something that's very hard to calculate. But all of you use it every day. And I want to make sure you realize that. You carry around your little iPhone, and it tells you where to go. And you're either on foot or in a car. And that relies on the following, that you have a set of satellites, 24 satellites that are up. Any given time, you can see about six. And those satellites have some corrections you have to make to measure the time. You measure the time for the lights, for the signal to go back and forth to the different ones and triangulate like I was doing in the beginning. But they're moving fast. So the satellites are going about 14,000 kilometers an hour when they're up in orbit. And you've probably heard the expression in special relativity that moving clocks tick more slowly. That's the theme. That's the relativistic correction for a clock. If it's going on an object that's fast, it actually goes more slowly. If you make that correction, which is special relativity, uh, it's seven microseconds a day. That's not enough. These still wouldn't work. You also have to make a correction. These are made inside the satellites, by the way. The second correction is made for general relativity. And general relativity, the fact is that the Earth's field, or the gravitational pull, is only one quarter as big at that height. And so clocks go faster by general relativity because there's less gravity. And that corresponds to 45 microseconds per day. So the GPS correction is 38 microseconds per day, which is made in the satellites. And the accuracy required to be able to have 10, millimeter, 10 meter resolution to stay, say, stay on a road, that's a pretty big road, is 30 nanoseconds. So I can just take the difference between those two and see that uh, it would only take you a couple minutes before you're off the road if you didn't make that correction. So all of you use general relativity every day. It's not general relativity in the region that I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. The region that's interesting for us is in what we call the weak field limit, which is this, where general relativity or maybe some alternate theory like it can explain things. What we're interested in is what happens when the fields get really strong. Black holes are an example. And in that limit, then we can test whether general relativity and the heart of general relativity is right, or we need some alternate uh, theory. So Einstein recognized one year after he had uh, come out with general relativity that the equations, if he set them up a certain way, had a, had a similarity to the equations that are used in electromagnetism. And we know that electromagnetism has electromagnetic waves. We have an electric field, we have a magnetic field, but we also have electromagnetic waves. So he predicted, by analogy, in 1916, that uh, there are, should be gravitational waves in analogy to electromagnetic waves. In our paper, where we saw that, said that there was a discovery, we glibly say in the first sentence that in 1916, Einstein predicted gravitational waves. The same year, a man named Schwarzschild predicted black holes. And 100 years later, we've seen it. The story's a little bit more complicated than that, like a lot more complicated. Uh, first, in this original paper of Einstein, he made a set of errors, one of them very serious. And he wrote a second paper two years later where he corrected the errors, never admitting they were errors, by the way, <laughs> but correcting the factor of two error, and most importantly, writing down how you make a gravitational wave, the so-called quadrupole formula. So to remind you, electromagnetic waves are made by taking a pair of charges and oscillating them like this, and that makes electromagnetic waves. And the famous experiment by Hertz in the 1880s he made a source like that, went in the next room and detected them, moved forward and backward, and saw that they were wave-like. And so that's the experiment we'd like to be able to do uh, here for gravitational waves. Anyway, 1918, this was still theory, so we're not doing the experiment yet. Uh, he saw that it's a quadrupole formula that makes gravitational waves, so we know how to make something that has four poles. Um, Einstein himself 
this was not accepted in the theoretical community. Einstein himself, 20 years later, doubted whether there were gravitational waves. And it comes back to the, what I said earlier, that you have this problem of trying to formulate a theory in all of space-time, and there's all these uh, uh, artificial singularities or infinities that come into it unless you set it up right. So Einstein, who worked with a man named Rosen, had just immigrated to the States from, from Berlin in 1932. In 1936, he, and he wrote three famous papers with his Rosen. But in 1936, he wrote a paper which he submitted to the most prestigious physics journal, which is where we submitted the uh, discovery, the physical review. And the title of the paper was, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? You can imagine. 20 years after he predicted them, if he put this title, what he was going to conclude in the paper itself. So he had gotten to a point where he was trying to write down the theory of gravitational waves more rigorously, found these singularities, so-called in the mathematics, and decided that he had been fooling himself and they were artificial, there really were no gravitational waves. And uh, he submitted it to FizRev, uh, and the man's name was John Tate, and, who was the editor of FizRev. Another thing historically is one thing that we do in science to make sure that people really believe our results and so forth is we have something called peer review, which we all take for granted now. But peer review was only starting at that time. And in fact, John Tate then as the editor had the option of you know, accepting something, rejecting something, or sending it for peer review. And uh, he sent this for peer review. This is from a Xerox of the pages from the log book in phys physical review where the, he, one thing was submitted and rejected, another one was accepted. This is Einstein and Rosen, you can't read it very well. And it was sent for review. We now know who the reviewer was. And the reviewer was uh, this man, uh, uh, Howard Percy Robertson, who was on uh, sabbatical from Princeton at that point and at my institution at Caltech. And he was an expert on general relativity as well. And uh, uh, he, as I say, Einstein and Rosen had used a single coordinate system to try to cover all of space time. And they had these singularities that bothered them. <coughs> he was the referee, which is anonymous. You don't tell people who the referee is. And he found the error. And he cast it in what we call cylindrical coordinates. And it removed the difficulty. So he sent that back to physical review. Uh, the editor. And the editor then sent a letter, which I've seen a copy of, to Einstein that basically you wouldn't do to a normal physicist, but it, you know, he's really kind. He basically said, would, would be God to have your reaction to the referee's comments rather than saying, maybe you're full of crap. <laughs> uh, Einstein uh, actually then uh, wrote back a letter, which I didn't include here, to uh, Tate and said uh, he sent his article to be published, not to be sent to some referee. And therefore, he wasn't going to publish in physical review. Uh, and in fact, Einstein never again published in physical review. He sent it instead to a, a journal which doesn't exist now called the Franklin Journal. Uh, associated with the Franklin Institute, which is in uh, Pennsylvania. And it took a long time to write an article in those days. You write an article, you submit it, people uh, then have to make uh, you know, copy edits, and it goes back and forth. So it took months to do the whole thing, which is lucky for Einstein. So in the meantime, Robertson returned to Princeton. There's no knowledge that he was the referee, but he had conversations with Princeton, with uh, Einstein's uh, uh, junior associate at that time, a man named Infeld. And uh, he told Infeld that he didn't believe this paper and explained to him the cylindrical coordinates. Infeld then uh, reported it to Einstein, who said, oh, yeah, I discovered the mistake last night. And rewrote the paper. Now the paper says on gravitational waves, not do they exist. The first sentence, which you can't read here, says they give a rigorous solution in cylindrical coordinates of, uh, and so forth. So tells you a little bit about uh, Einstein. <laughs> OK. 
Convincing Einstein at that point still didn't convince the theoretical community that gravitational waves existed. That went on for maybe another 20 years. And finally, there was a uh, conference in, in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, sponsored by the Air Force with 40 famous theorists of the day. And uh, they were looking at gravity and gravitational waves in that meeting. And uh, a man named Pirani, who was not well known, but was Hungarian, made a presentation the very first day uh, of gravitational waves, which almost convinced everybody that at gravitational waves exist by formulating it in a way they could do. And then Feynman was there, and he said, if, they, if gravitational waves exist, they have to be able to transfer energy. You can't just say they're there, but they have to be able to transfer energy. So he made the idea of a Gedanken experiment, a fake experiment, one in your head, of how it transfers energy, and everybody became convinced that it could. And then that was the main idea of the experiment that followed, which I think I show in the next slide. So the theory community finally agreed almost 40 years after this was produced that it should, <coughs> gravitational waves should exist. Then it became an experimental problem and it's taken us another 60 years. The, the, I guess I didn't show this, but the, what, what um, maybe I do, but I'll say it in words. The idea was to take a big bar, a big aluminum bar, and, uh, you know, if you go up to an aluminum bar and you hit it with a hammer, it'll ring at some resonant frequency. But the idea is if a gravitational wave comes through, it stretches it or squashes it, and if you put sensitive detectors around the middle, you transfer energy to those and you can record it. So there was an experiment made to try to measure gravitational waves with that idea. It, the, the guy that did it claimed discovery a couple times, but it wasn't right. So then it moved on to our, ours. This is an equation, again, I don't pretend to tell you. I can formulate general relativity in a way that I can get equations of this form. I won't bother to tell you how. Uh, and it, for some of you, if you know a little bit of electrodynamics, might look familiar. It's what's called the wave equation. So it's the equation that does electromagnetic waves with some different symbols. In our case, it's, so it's like the wave equation, and that's why I want to make the leap to gravitational waves, with the strength of it being this thing here h mu nu. In gravitational uh, waves or in general relativity, that's called the strain, but it's the amplitude of the, of the signal itself. So that's it. If I want to change it to a form then, it means that this strain takes the form of, of a plane wave. Just like in electromagnetism, it has two components. In electromagnetism, we have E and H, two components, of, and they're at 90 degrees to each other. And the only difference here is that they're not at 90 degrees to each other, but they're at 45 degrees to each other. And if anybody's really sharp in the audience, they can say why, but I'll explain it. The reason is quantum mechanical. Even though the experiments that we're talking about are going to be classical, it's quantum mechanical. Uh, the photon has a spin, that spin is one unit. And the graviton, or gravity, has a spin of two. And a spin of two, uh, with a spin of two, you get 45 degrees instead of 90 degrees to each other. So it looks the same, except they're at 45 degrees to each other. This is something we can decompose if we have good enough data in the experiments that I'll talk about. So now we want to make it an experimental problem. We want to try to, try to measure gravitational waves. Clearly, the right thing to do, if we can do it, is uh, what Hertz did in electromagnetic waves. Go create it in the lab, go in the next room, and do it. So we need to make a quadrupole moment. We do that by taking a pair of uh, uh, barbell with some weights on the end and spinning it around. That also should sound to you a little bit like the picture I did at the beginning of two black holes going around each other. So if I make a barbell, and I make, exaggerate and make it as strong as I can, make this weight 1,000 kilograms, this weight 1,000 kilograms, maybe a meter in between them, and we spin it at a kilohertz and get out of the room, uh, then we can go in the next room and look for gravitational waves. So I spin it. If I go and look for gravitational waves, the strength that I get, which I measure in this little h, is 10 to the minus 35. The strength that I'm going to show you that we get from the black holes is 10 to the minus 21. And we've struggled for years to be able to get sensitive enough to do that. 
So doing the experiment in a classical way where you do it in a laboratory is 14 orders of magnitude more difficult than what I'll try to describe to you that we did with uh, black holes. An experimentalist likes to do this because you control all the variables. We're fortunate in our case, we can't control all the variables, but the part that we can't control turns out to be very interesting because it's about black holes. Okay, so this is the same barbell, but the one we saw, the reconstruction of the parameters that we saw, which I'll try to say how we know, they're each about 30 times the mass of the sun. They're separated by about 100 kilometers. Uh, they are spinning at about 100 hertz, and uh, uh, they're uh, 500 megaparsecs away, which is 1.3 billion light years away. Okay. Now, to take this strength, h equals 10 to the minus 21, and to change it into what you do experimentally, what does it do to space itself? It changes a length in the direction that it's happening compared to the length itself that I'm looking, say, take a meter stick. It's going to change it by one part in 10 to the 21. So this little h corresponds to a delta L over L. And that's what we're going to try to measure. 10 to the minus 21 should sound like an impossibly small number. Uh, but let's see now what it means. So the amplitude of the wave is something like 10 to the minus 21. That's the one that we actually saw and we're looking for. Uh, the change in, that corresponds to a change in length over length somehow in space. And uh, if we take then a, a ring of free masses, they're free to move where they want, and we put them in a circle, and then a gravitational wave comes through, it's going to stretch it by this delta L. So this side's going to get longer, and this side shorter with whatever frequency the gravitational wave has. So as uh, if it's 30 times a second, it'll go back and forth between being tall and, and fat, back and forth. So it's a little bit like standing in front of these mirrors in an amusement park where one of them makes you short and fat, and the other one tall and thin, and you go back and forth 30 times a second. So that's basically what we're trying to measure. And it, uh, just to emphasize how small I'm talking about, uh, we all know what a meter stick is. Uh, human hair, I don't have many left, but a human hair uh, is about 100 microns, or 10,000 times smaller than a meter stick. The wavelength of light, the light in this laser beam, is about one micron, or 100 times smaller than, the, uh, hair, than a human hair. An atomic diameter the size of an atom is 10 to the minus 10 meters, or 10,000 times smaller than the wavelength of this laser light. And uh, a proton diameter, which is what we do in particle accelerators, or what we're made of, is 100,000 times smaller than an atom. It's really right at the center of an atom. It's 10 to the minus 15 meters. And so the LIGO sensitivity, which is 10 to the minus 18 meters is a thousand times smaller than the proton. So this is when you can start disbelieving me. <laughs> <laughs> but the trick is, and I'll come to that, but in case I forget to do it, it's a little bit like how accurately can you measure that you get half heads and half tails? You do it by making the measurement many, 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 many times. And that's what statistics does for you. Flipping it 10 times is not a very good experiment. So you don't find out how many heads versus tails there are, but if you flip it a million times, you get the right uh, answer. So we do that by making the measurement over and over and over again, and I'll tell you how we do that. So this is what we expect now qualitatively. These two objects are going around each other, like the ones I showed in the first slide. They're probably spinning. So they're spinning and they're going around each other. They may be oriented with each other, or they may be tilted with each other. Interesting question. And then they start merging together, and that makes something that looks like this. And then they come to the merger itself. The merger itself is something we don't know how to calculate, and that's why I said that data starts to enable us to understand general relativity where the strengths get incredibly strong, where we can test the limits of general relativity itself. And then at the end, it has to ring down in some way and you need that because you've absorbed quantum numbers like spin and charge and all these things that have to be preserved. So 
somehow it, it rings down at the end. And this is the signal, which should, this hand-drawn thing I drew maybe 15 years ago or 20 years ago, and it should look similar to the thing I showed on the very first slide. So we kind of knew what we were looking for. Okay, so it turns out that there's an ideal technique to try to measure small differences in distance. It's really hard to measure the length of a meter stick. It's not as hard to measure the difference between two things that are nearly identical, sometimes. In this case, what we expect to happen is that we have a curvature of space-time, like the picture that I showed you, which I'm showing in, in a pictorial way here, which changes length this way versus length that way. And uh, if I look then at a normal interferometer, an interferometer is an instrument that has a laser beam coming this way, you divide the beam in half, so half of it goes this way, half of it goes that way. As long as the two lengths are the same, the light comes back at the same time. You invert one compared to the other, they cancel, and your uh, detector sees nothing but black light. So that's kind of the idea. But if one of the arms gets a little longer than the other, then the time it takes to go down one arm is different than the other. They're then out of phase and you can uh, see what happens. So here's a, just a little video show, demonstrating that. The light comes in, it's split in both sides, and nothing or almost nothing goes. Now if you start changing the length, then, uh, and then you can see light starts coming through. So that's the idea. This just shows it more in wavelengths, uh, but I'm gonna skip that. Okay, so we built two very fancy interferometers. I'll show you what I mean by fancy in a few minutes. One in Livingston, Louisiana, one in Hanford, Washington. You can ask me why, politics. <laughs> uh, we basically had made a team at Caltech and MIT to do this. Uh, since there had to be two interferometers, we said we should put one near the Owens Valley, which is a nice geological place in California. Uh, they said they'd like one in southern Maine, not too far from MIT. Uh, we couldn't propose that because the government has to decide. We only call them sample sites. Submitted it to the government. They approved the project, but it came back this way. <laughs> Luckily, we had a senator from both states who were strong supporters for quite a few years when we needed it. So uh, that was good. This experiment, by the way, up to date has cost $1.5 billion. So it's a lot of money. This is a picture of the two interferometers. Uh, you can see the geology is quite different. Hanford, Washington is high desert and very stable ground, but uh, the desert is not, uh, is hard to live on in different ways. And this is Livingston, Louisiana. It's in a commercial pine forest. It used to be owned when we took it over by Schlumberger. And uh, we basically, through uh, the university, Louisiana State University, bought a small strip to put the interferometer. So these are the two sides of the <coughs> interferometers. We make them as long as we can practically do on the Earth's surface, which is limited by the curvature of the Earth. We don't want it to get too high or too low. So it's about four kilometers. They're four kilometers. Inside, this is just the inside to see that these are big vacuum vessels. Inside of these are mirrors and lasers and so forth to make the beam. So it looks a little more complicated than the a picture that I showed you. And now we make, so we make this interferometer. What limits us so that we can actually make this measurement? What is it that we have to defeat and really makes it hard and why is it taking us so long? So let me try to give you just a sense of what we have to deal with. So we wanna measure a small difference in the two lengths as a function of time. And the first thing that limits you is residual gas scattering. That is the light comes here goes in the two arms, but scatters off a molecule, hits the side of the sidewall, comes back, had a different longer path, and now it's out of time. So we have to work at high vacuum. We have the largest high vacuum system in the world because of this. So LIGO has 16 kilometers of vacuum at about 10 to the minus nine tor, um, and, uh, uh, and that's good enough to keep this in control. This, the second problem is the laser itself. And we need a laser that's much better than lasers that are, exist commercially in three forms, in terms of the wavelength, in terms of the amplitude fluctuations, and the pointing. So we do a lot of special work 
<coughs> stabilizing the laser to a cavity in order to make it very uh, precise. Third thing, which is the one that you should listen to because it's the one that really mattered for making the discovery that we made, is seismic noise. That the Earth shakes, and so this test mass shakes, and the length doesn't stay the same because it moved a little bit. So we have to keep and beat the shaking of the Earth, which I'll come to how we do that. Uh, then the fourth one is what we call thermal noise. I'll show you where this is in our distribution, or the fancy physics name this is named after somebody called Brownian, called Brownian motion. Uh, this exists as long as we work at room temperature. If we, in the future, go to low temperature, which is not easy technically, if we go to low temperature, then this noise could be made smaller, and it's one of the one of the areas that we're look, working toward in the future. And then lastly, we get to more fundamental things that limit us. And so I give the main example, which is if we increase the laser beam enough, so it's strong enough, has a lot of photons, it actually pre puts radiation pressure on the mirror. So we have a lot of photons, which is our equivalent of having a lot of heads and tails to do, so we measure it many times. But eventually we get in the issue of we beat, uh, we have a good statistics, but we also move the masses from the uh, radiation pressure. Okay, so what we end up with is this schematic picture here. What's shown is frequency this way and uh, sensitivity this way. This is my 10 to the minus 21. Okay. This is the different backgrounds. For example, this is residual gas. If I had 10 to the minus 6 tor, this is 10 to the minus 9 tor, uh, and the other backgrounds. These, th the shaded region is where the detectors will be sensitive. And uh, you'll see that it's limited by three different things. At the lowest frequencies, that's below 100 hertz, it's limited by seismic noise. And that is what prevented us, and eventually by solving our, improving our ability there, enabled us to make this discovery. So that's called seismic noise. At high frequencies, we're limited by what interferometer people call shot noise. Uh, particle physicists might call it photostatistics. It's basically the number of photons you have. You're, you're, and uh, in the middle frequencies, we're limited by the fact that we wor work at room temperature. So this is basically the frequency range. And <clears throat> anything that happens up in here, we can detect over the noise. And our constant problem is to beat these noises down uh, as much as we can. Higher power laser to keep this down, uh, mitigate the shaking of the earth to beat this one, and say cooling the test masses to beat that one. And it's something that we continually uh, work on. This is the real picture. So this is the picture of the interferometer itself, which should look familiar. It's falling at this side from seismic noise. Uh, this is thermal noise, and this is the shot noise. Now, by analogy, this is exactly like the problem of our ear. We're not doing acoustics, but our laboratory that we're trying to work on is the Earth. Our ears are also trying to work on the Earth. And so our ears, through evolution, have adapted to how to work on the Earth. If, we, if it goes down, and this, if our ears were sensitive to lower frequencies than we uh, uh, presently cut off, the Earth is very noisy. It's shaking like crazy, as you can see. It goes up and up and up very steeply. It goes as the frequency to the fourth power. If you go to very high frequencies, our ears cut off because we can't sample fast enough. In the same way, this cuts off because we don't have enough photons. So we're not doing acoustical, but it's similar, and it's the same frequency band. It is the laboratory that we can work on on the Earth's surface. I may, if I don't run totally out of time, show you that if you go in space, you can work in a different frequency band. So this is it. These little spikes that you see here are in any technical instrument that you make that there's going to be uh, resonant frequencies just from the mounts that hold it up, from the electronics, 60 cycle, whatever else. And those are the little ones. We know most of those. We notch them out. It's about 1% of the, uh, of the uh, scale. So now we want to make it better. So we built this in 2000 or so. We knew we wanted to make it better. This is how we make it better. And this is what's called advanced LIGO. When you read the press, it always says advanced LIGO increase the power of the laser. So we've gone from a 20-watt 
very specialized laser. It works at 1064 nanometers neodymium YAG laser uh, to 200 watts. It's a single line laser, and that's where we work. And the middle frequencies, we try to improve the suspension system to make it more uh, uh, pure and less thermal noise, and at low frequencies, better seismic isolation. So just to give a sense of that, that's the optics. They're big, few silica mirrors uh, that look like a beautiful piece of glass because to our eyes, we see right through them. But at 1064 nanometers, we have a reflective coating that you don't see. This is the key to the measurement. So this is where you should wake up for a minute. Uh, and that is what we did in initial LIGO is have several layers of isolation from the earth, just like you do in your car, just shock absorbers, a little fancier, but shock absorbers that take a bump from the earth and move it to lower frequency. That's what happens when you go for a bump on the road. We have three layers of it, very specially made, and it reduces the shaking of the earth at, in that region by a factor of 10 to the 10th, so it's pretty good. But it wasn't good enough. And so what we worked on for a decade is adding the little things that are shown in insets here, which is to basically build the equivalent of these uh, acoustical earphones that you use on an airplane. Uh, on an airplane, it measures the ambient background from the roar of the engines, cancels it, and you have a nice quiet flight. In our case, we have to know what, this, we have mirrors, so we have to know what direction this ambient noise is coming from. So if it's coming one direction, we have to correct in that direction. So we have to do it, to know the directionality, the directionality in three linear directions and any rotational directions. So this is the system that we've designed and built is six dimensional and looking at all these dimensions and correcting for the ambient background that escapes the shock absorbers, basically. And that is the thing that improved us. I'll show you how. It's all in vacuum. Uh, this is the fancy laser, just to show you that it exists as a, and what it looks like. This is that same sensitivity curve. This is the best we got after uh, building this starting in 1994, and that curve there is 2013. Then we put in the technologies that I said, a higher power laser improved here, uh, better test masses improved here, and the improvement over here is due to the uh, active seismic isolation. So over the whole frequency band, this is a log scale, we improved by a factor of roughly three. And for us, that tells us that we can see three times further out into the universe, which is 27 times more galaxies and so forth, three cubed. At low frequencies, though, we gained a factor of 100. And the factor of 100, we cube to see the rate, that's 100 cubed is a, a meant that in a day or two days of running, we were more sensitive than we'd been in 10 years of the previous uh, detector. So this is the big difference that enabled us to see uh, these events was the active seismic isolation. So that's it. That's the tech as much as I'll show the technology. Now let me just show you a little bit more about the event and how we know what it is. So we saw uh, something that looked like this. And then the merger here, so this is, this is the merger, this is the uh, in spiral, the merger, and then a little ringing down here. This is not the raw data. This is the fit to the raw data using general relativity. And once we use general relativity, then we can pull out the different parameters. What I show here is the velocity that those have. And I mentioned at the beginning, this is 6 tenths the speed of light. This is 3 tenths the speed of light. It's this graph here. So it's rapidly going up past half the speed of light by the time they merge. It's unbelievable. And this is how far apart they are merging together in a unit which we call, technically call Schwarzschild radii, but you can think of it as about 50 kilometer for each unit. So they're about, at, when, they, when we start, about 200 kilometers apart. It took two tenths of a second, roughly, in our apparatus for this to merge. It was, of course, doing it earlier at lower frequency, but by the time it got to our frequencies, it was about two tenths of a second in the apparatus itself. Since that time, we've seen two other events. So 
one of the big issues, of course, when we saw the first one is do we declare victory and declare that we saw something new based on a single observation, which is always scary. Uh, we did, but we knew we had a second one. And the second one is quite different. It's lower in mass and goes out uh, into our apparatus for almost two seconds because being lower in mass, it goes to higher frequencies. And this is then a picture of the uh, sensitivity curve this first event, which is the biggest event, but it cuts off because the masses are so high. And then the second event is out here. And the third event, which we don't call an event because its probability isn't quite high enough for discovery, uh, is shown there. So with this, we already can do things like trying to test general relativity. So we have these events. What, what have we learned other than the fact that we've seen black hole binaries? The first thing is that we can test and see whether this transmitting gravitational wave has something accompanying it, like the photon accompanies electromagnetic waves, something which we in physics call a graviton. So it's a par particle that has spin two, and it's very light, but it's part of what transmits it, like other phenomena that we know. We don't expect that to be true in general relativity. This is our measurement. Well, how do we do it? If there was a mass associated with it, it would slightly distort these, uh, these curves that we measure. And we can look then for how much distortion we can allow and still fit the, the curves that we measure. And basically, it sets a limit of 10 to the minus 22, a very small number, electron volts per uh, c squared. Now, we've always thought that one thing you can do if you see gravitational waves, and that's what I've emphasized so far, is test general relativity or the whole idea of general relativity. The second is that it's a new way to look at the universe. So the first thing that we saw demonstrates that stellar binary black holes exist. We conclude that. They've never been seen before. Inferred, yes, never been seen. Second is that we've inferred more than that or seen more than that that now has to be explained. They, they exist in binary pairs, you know, just like we have the Earth around the Sun. They're not just single objects. That within the lifetime of the universe, some of them merge. So we've seen several examples of that. So we have to be able to explain that. And lastly, they're much heavier than anyone ever expected. So from everything in, in, uh, inferred from electromagnetic radiation, especially the fact that heavy stars aren't stable, the idea that a heavy star can collapse and give a black hole, wasn't expected to be much higher than 10 solar masses. We have one that's 60. So uh, this is completely new and now has to be explained. And so the idea that starting to look at a different way to look at the universe, you start seeing new things, which we can't explain yet, uh, is true even on the very first events we saw. So just an idea of what else we can see. So we saw coalescing, a coalescing binary system that was black holes. We can also look for coalescing system made from what are called neutron stars. Neutron stars are not black holes. They're made from the collapse of a, of a star. But then they're a very concentrated nuclear matter in a very concentrated place. And so if we look at and study neutron stars, we can try to understand or start to understand nuclear physics in a very big extreme, which is you know, a very high pressure and a high uh, volume and density. So that's those. The second is we look for signals. These happen to look like the signals that I showed. We also look for signals that might be just a big burst of gravitational radiation. Examples of that can be the collapse of a star. Uh, it can be what are called gamma ray bursts. It could be things from the early universe, things we call cosmic strings. A third one, and this is the long-term goal, I think, the most romantic goal you can have for gravitational waves. And that is trying to really understand the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. Well, what we understand now comes from electromagnetic radiation photons, which get absorbed. So when things were very dense at the beginning, <coughs> at the beginning, they got absorbed. But uh, if you want to go back earlier in time, there's really only two choices, neutrinos, which don't get as absorbed. That turns out to be impractical. Or gravitational waves, which is the best of all. So. Getting back to the very early universe is one of our big goals. We're not technically able to do that yet, but I think uh, it'll happen. 
And the last is continuous sources. That is, we have, uh, we have in our own galaxy uh, objects that go around and radiate electromagnetic waves like a uh, lighthouse, you know, with certain frequencies called pulsars. And uh, those are spinning neutron stars, we believe. And if the spinning neutron star has what I talked about earlier, a quadrupole moment, it'll give gravitational waves. So we've looked at some of the well-known ones and limited them to no more than a millimeter mountains on the surface. So, so far we haven't seen them, but we hope to in the future. Uh, there's other uh, the, uh, detectors that are coming online so that as we go into the next decade or beyond, the Japanese have uh, been building in the same place they did their famous neutrino experiments, uh, what I might call a, a 2.5 generation detector. It's cool to low temperature. I told you that would help make quiet test masses. Uh, and it's underground where the seismic shaking is less. So that, and we look forward to them coming on. They're having a lot of technical difficulties getting there. And in Europe, there's a very ambitious proposal for a third generation detector built like a triangle, uh, 10 kilometers on a side, and uh, it may be built in the next 10 to 20 years. So that's everything that's done on the Earth. Just like for uh, astronomy, everything isn't the optical wavelength that we look at with an optical telescope. We use x-rays, infrared, um, microwaves, all things to understand the universe. And it's been, in the last 50 years, the fact that we look at the same phenomenon in these different wavelengths that have given so much information about what's going on. So in the same way, gravitational waves present uh, frequencies that go from very high frequencies to very low frequencies, and the same thing can be done in the next generations. We can go in space and uh, study phenomenon that aren't milliseconds like what I studied, what we studied, but minutes or hours. So it's completely different. They, they have a, a proposal to put three satellites in space, widely separated, uh, with laser beams going between them. And if a gravitational wave comes through, it again affects the timing between them. So that's a uh, European Space Agency scheduled for about 2030. Uh, the, if we want to get to years or decades, it's time scales. We do what's called pulsar timing, that is look at the timing of some object that we know and understand and look for differences over some long period. And those experiments are also just getting underway. And lastly, at the billions of years, we're talking about the early universe. So we're back to the early universe. And uh, in that case, we can do either direct detection of gravitational waves or the possibility that you can see the effects of gravitational waves as an imprint on the detailed distributions that are seen uh, looking at the uh, signals from the early universe. And with that, I've done it. I think we have a few, uh, few minutes for questions. Anybody have a question? I've got one, as usual, but yeah, back somewhere. Okay, got one. Say a few more words what you mean by change. I mean, does the, uh, the strength of gravity as we generally know it, I mean, does we, it change when, a, when it's stored? So is that the only thing that would change it? Uh, the, the strength of gravity itself, as far as we know, is constant. But uh, it could, if there's some mechanism, it, it could change and we wouldn't know, know it. So. I can't answer you by saying that there's no, there's no theorem that says it can't change. We think of it as a constant, the strength, just like Newton did, that there was a constant in front. But uh, I don't think we have, you know, any way to say very accurately that it doesn't change somehow with time, that it was different maybe in the early universe than now. And some of the uh, evolutionary theories that people have in cosmology about the universe change, do change the strength in time, something that was a constant. Uh, in Einstein's theory is no longer a constant. Uh, 
I, I suppose at some level, but they, of course they're so weak and these distortions are so small that it's a, a very small effect. But clearly you, if you go through a portion of space where there's other distortions, uh, it gets added on top. They don't interact with each other at any level. Up front. Yeah. Uh, so since LIGO's been running, you've only found one? No, I showed uh, 2.9. <laughs> because the third one, the third one that I showed is 90% probable that it's a gravitational wave. So we don't claim it because we're still in a discovery regime where you have to show with 99.999%. But it's each of the ones that we've seen come from black hole collisions. They were somewhat different from each other. The heaviest one was the first one I showed. The other two are somewhere in between. One was considerably lighter. Oh, yeah, sorry, and that spin of the black holes that emerge, that all happens in two times of the The final, the, the, the final merger that, that we're visit, that we're looking at, which is after it's reached the, uh, you know, the, the frequencies that we can see, is two tenths of a second for the first event, two seconds for one of the other events, because it was lighter. But it's basically the time it spins above 10 hertz of going around. So I was wondering, the projects you work on could span decades sometimes, and I'm wondering, how do you stay motivated and focused? Oh, is it working? How do you, so you work on um, projects that sometimes take decades. How do you stay motivated and focused especially in the face of a lack of knowing um, whether it's going to be successful or not. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, I always Sorry. thought of myself as someone who loves instant gratification. You know, I like to do something one day that at the end of the day I can say I, I've done something. So I, I, I really don't know. I've stayed with this problem. I thought it was solvable. I thought we could do it in shorter time maybe, but I we thought we could do it. And I have no idea of the psychology. I need to add to that because that's a great question, I think. What's the balance of uh, hope and belief to keep you going every day in your team, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think by now, because Einstein's theory is 100 years old, the hope part uh, that there is that there are such things or are gravitational waves, I think is in small letters. Mm -hmm. the, the Whether we could whether it would be strong enough for us to measure, whether we can make a good enough detector, that's been the challenge. And there, probably because we could incrementally see what to do, so you could see that you can make it better continually, uh, maybe is what kept us going. There's little steps of instant gratification on the way. I have two questions. One is, based on, on what you've seen so far, um, do you have a sense for how many black holes are potentially out there and visible? Yeah, and, that, the, and the second one is, did it change your view because you've seen it with this frequency so far? Yeah. So the, the first question is, what do we know about the population? And maybe I'll add in where they came from. So uh, seeing two or three events, do we know anything about the population? We do more than you might think because uh, we know how, where they came from and in distance, we know the masses, and we can look for kind of extreme models for how they might exist. Using extreme models, we can, we can limit the population, the number of them out there by about a factor, it doesn't sound great, but it's pretty good, factor of 100, that is finite, and that it's not more than 100 times more than the number that we say is finite, uh, just based on two or three events. One of our desires is to measure the population well enough uh, so that we can try to understand what the shape is, try to understand where they are, in order to get at what I hinted was maybe one of the really important questions. How did these originate? Did they originate by the collapse of a star? Which goes against our idea that stars kind of fall apart if they're too big. Uh, or were they made somehow in the early universe and they're eating each other up, the ones that are there? We don't know. So, But there are differences in the dynamics of what they might look like, how they might behave, what the spins are like, and so forth that may give us clues. So I can't answer you definitively, but it's the kind of questions we're asking. Hi. So Hi. when you were talking about Newton and the apple, um, you know, the 
I guess you have the, the, the mass of the Earth pulling on the apple. Why do we perceive or why do we experience gravity as such a weak force in comparison to the other forces? And then does the um, proof of gravitational waves have anything to do with the accelerated expansion of the universe? Uh, yeah, let me take them one at a time. So the first one was the apple gets pulled to the Earth, so why do we say gravity is so weak? There's lots of protons in the Earth. So if you, if you go back to, to uh, Newton's picture, it's just the masses are big, and, and that's what causes the strength. The strength doesn't change in Einstein's theory. It's just where it comes from is how much, uh, how much there's a distortion of space and time. We know that gravity is really weak compared to the other forces because we do a lot of experimentation with individual protons, electrons, and atoms, on particle accelerators and so forth. And uh, when we do experiments on how particles interact with each other, we have to take into account, for example, electromagnetic effects, even though it may not be the nuclear effects we're looking at. They're a factor of 100 smaller. It turns out that gravity is orders and orders of magnitude smaller than that, so we don't have to take that into account uh, very much. If we look at the particles going around, say the big accelerator at CERN, uh, they don't, they go around many, many times, but they don't drop down toward the Earth, the pull toward the Earth. So it's really the fact that, uh, it, I mean, those are very qualitative, but basically on the basis of a single proton or electron, it's incredibly weak. Second question was, expansion of the universe. Yeah, the expansion of the universe. The way I hinted at that, I think, directly, I don't know. But uh, but soon, I think we're, we'll have information about the early universe, which tells you what it's really doing. That's where we get the key from gravitational waves, either by the imprint of the gravitational waves on the photon signals that we measure, or maybe even directly in time. We can't do it directly with LIGO or the wrong frequency, but with time. And I think the clue to really understanding the expansion of the universe or the fate of the universe is going back and understanding what happened at early times. Afterwards, it's kind of been carrying out whatever its mission was. But understanding, we have what we call inflationary universe or different models of what happened at the beginning in order to form uh, particles and galaxies and so forth and so on. If you just take a big bang and let it expand, you wouldn't get them. And so uh, we have all these models, but they're not well tested. We have to get back to earlier times. Uh, not tomorrow, but gravitational waves are one of the probably most exciting possibilities how we can actually study the really early times. Thank you. Hello. Um, it's, uh... Uh, Newton's uh, theory of gravitation, right? Is, is that in odds with gravitation wave, or you can say that space-time distortion kind of describes gravitational theory a little bit in detail? I, I'm I'm not sure uh, I understood your question. Like but Newton's theory, right? Like you're, you try, you're trying to two masses. You want me to reconcile Newton's yes, theory? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Newton's theory is in today's language. If somebody did it, is a set of empirical formulas that you can use that work most places. They're empirical. Nobody tells you why it's pulling on each other. And, but it describes a macroscopic events as it did, whether it's the tides or planets going around. Uh, but to actually understand gravity in a more detailed way, you wouldn't use the words that go along with Newton's empirical formulas, that is, the Earth pulling on the apple. Those, those now we think are the wrong words, but rather the fact that the Earth distorts space around it such that the apple is attracted, very much like the trampoline picture. But the formula is a good empirical formula. It describes much of what happens with our um, solar system and rockets and everything else. So it, it's, it's good. Uh, your observation on the mass of the black holes, how does it work with the dark matter theory? And does it explain part of it? Does it... One, one of the... I mean, how do we know these are black holes first? It's really a combination of uh, the fact that uh, it's a unique amount of uh, mass in a small region that has all the characteristics that we describe. We have not, nothing else like that. However, 
Uh, one of the early papers after our discovery that came out was written by at least one person was a Nobel Prize winner, uh, hypothesizing that maybe this is part of the answer for the dark matter. Um, it's an incomplete theory. <laughs> uh, so we have a good theory of black holes. We don't know the, pop the populations that I talk about within a factor of 100 that don't describe the, uh, the dark matter. We also have dark matter in our own galaxy, for example, not just in the universe. And we don't, except for the center of our galaxy, we don't have black holes around. So I, we don't think that is much of the answer for the, the dark matter. Uh, I have a question on uh, biological cells. Do they have any uh, relation with the gravitational force? Does what? Biological cells, like the living organism cells. Uh, I've heard that like if, 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 if a person is traveling in the space away from gravity, he ages slower than the person who is closer uh, in, the, in a bigger gravity. So, Yeah, of course, everybody who's read science fiction <laughs> knows that there's all these ideas. And at some scale, it's not very much. Uh, clocks tick more slowly. Does that mean bio biologically you might live a fraction of a second longer or something? I, I, uh, I don't know. In principle, uh, it applies to inert things. Does that make biological? Can you make the extrapolation of biological things? I'm not sure. But in principle, yes, there's no laws that are violated. So you could stretch time a little bit and make clocks tick more slowly. So um, you mentioned at the beginning that progress was made in science when we find discrepancies in what we expect and what we observe. So what were you rooting for in this case before you made the discovery to find a perfect match or find something new? Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, what drove me to somebody said what drove me to do this problem? I, what drives me to do this is actually that we should see things that have nothing to do with the electromagnetic spectrum. Here we're looking at the sky in a completely new way. So there must be, every time we've looked at a different wavelength in astronomy, we found phenomena, that, quasars or something, phenomena that people never saw before. It would be a miracle in my mind if using gravitational waves, there wouldn't be complete surprises. So we have a whole group in LIGO that looks for things like this, the known things we calculate, we look for, we use, I didn't say the details, we calculate 250,000 templates using general relativity on computers to compare with each strip, strip of data to look at this. It's all kind of boring, except that uh, black holes are interesting. We have another group that basically uh, looks for gener generic signals. In other words, forget what the shape might be. Uh, they could come from something we don't anticipate at all. By the way, that group saw this signal just because it isn't biased against seeing something like this. Uh, and in our paper, we show the data from that group, which didn't, which, which saw it actually before the templates were used. But it's my, not just dream, I think expectation that the most interesting things we'll find, I can't tell you because they basically, everything I'm telling you comes from what we know in the electromagnetic spectrum or from theory, but there's not much theory outside of that. So we have a whole group that looks at that, some of that, Work is very interesting because we use tools like machine learning uh, to try to look in the most creative ways at, at changes in the distributions. So, okay. so uh, you actually gave one of the slides that, that, you know, how we use GPS today and triangulation. So are there applications that, that we hope to come or, or kind of even futuristic of whether it's navigation or anything that's applicational? Uh, that's a good question. Certainly, uh, Hertz did electromagnetic waves in the 1880s, and we've had the world transformed in front of us in using electromagnetic waves for communication and everything else you can imagine. These are so weak that we don't, at least at this point, see direct use. I, I think the, uh, the, the main kind of practical output, which is not my thing, for what we've done so far is the technologies that we've developed. But uh, gravitational waves and gravitational physics itself, how it might affect life, I, 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 don't, I don't have the imagination to know. It's pretty weak. Um, so a lot of the things going on in kind of the nearby region 
in Silicon Valley revolve around you know faster computers, and as you get faster computers, you have you know things like artificial intelligence. So that's kind of a lot of the hype going around in this area. So how has that impacted um, your research? You know, computational power at least. Uh, several of the problems we look at are computer limited or algorithm limited. Uh, first, uh, computer limited. The the best example. I showed very briefly on one slide where I said we want to look for spinning pulsars that give light out. And the ones that we've looked at are ones that are stable and known and uh, are uh, at some given frequency. And so we look at those. They don't take a lot of computing power. The problem is that if you make a pulsar, it's usually made from the collapse of a star. The time when it will be not so symmetrical as not to have any mountains on it is when it's young, when it's made young. And then it isn't already known but from radio telescopes. So we search the whole sky, meaning we have to know where things go and so forth. It's an enormous computing problem. We search the whole sky uh, using that. The ability to do it on our computers is still much too limited, although much better than it was when we started in 1994. And so we've created something all of you probably have heard of uh, or know of of SETI using your home computers. Or we have the equivalent called Einstein at home. Look it up. If you want to give us your background cycles <laughs> when you're not using your laptop, we use it to look for uh, to look for spinning pulsars. Einstein at home, and it's, it does the same idea. It just takes background cycles, and we have much more computing power from that for doing that than we do in our captive computers that we own or use. The, the second part of that is advanced techniques, like machine, I mentioned machine learning, you said AI. And we're trying to be more clever about looking for unknown signals by using machine learning techniques. So we've attracted a whole bunch of experts in this field to work with us as their hobby, if you want. And uh, we're, it's, it's uh, kind of, for us, we were very dedicated to trying to see something. Now we're getting more inventive. So it, it's, I think, is a, is a promising way that we can look more creatively or, let's say, with more, in a more evolutionary way at the data by learning and, and uh, reducing background compared to possible signals. Ten hertz. I heard yeah, that. Yeah, ten hertz seems like a, an awfully specific number uh, for the two black holes orbiting each other before they <laughs> annihilate, right? Um, it, it seems like they would speed up or slow down, or um, you know, when I imagine two things spiraling into each other, it's like one of those coins going around into a funnel. It speeds up quite a bit towards right. the bottom, so. Right. Right. Can you talk so, about that? Yeah. So what I showed was the very, all we can do is see what's happening after it's 10 hertz or higher. What I showed there, there was one graph, which you probably missed, which uh, showed that when it enters our apparatus at 10 hertz, it's about a third the speed of light. And by the time they actually are merging, it's more than half the speed of light. If we go back in time, to lower frequency, if the space experiment that I briefly mentioned had been operational now instead of 2030, uh, it could have possibly seen this event a year or two years before us at much lower frequencies and at much slower speeds. So this whole process is going on, and we're just, because of our limitations, only able to see the very final stages of a, of a merger. Okay, Barry, I don't know how to thank you enough. You are absolutely an amazing. Thank you. We're so lucky to have you here, and we're so uh, lucky to have you, period. I'm enjoying it. So. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Really great. Fascinating.